Wow, that was quite an intro. Thank you. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Thank you for, for taking the time to listen to what we have to say. And thank you to Tunes for having us, basically. That's what uh, I feel like a kid whenever you always get taught to say, thank you for having me. But that's, that's what I wanted to say. So um, my name is Pete Dodd. I am Danish and Australian, but I, I'm based in London, UK, and have been, been living there for <clears throat> nearly 20 years now. Um, I do mostly CG and stop motion, um, and you can see some of the projects I've worked on. Whoa, they're very live, sorry. <laughs> um, here behind me. And um, I've worked on mostly a number of animated features, series, and commercials in lots of different roles, actually, from director to writer, uh, lead animator, and, uh, and also animator, which is how I started, basically, um, many moons ago. So. I'll take you through some projects today focusing mostly on the early stages of development, what you first work on when you're figuring out how to put something together. Um, we're going to look at a range of different styles, um, from short form to long form, but also, and also I want to look at a little bit about stop motion, because obviously most people will not be familiar with that technique. Um, and to end off, I want to show you a new project called Belephant. Um, this video was finished literally this week, so you'll be the first in the world to see it. Um, so that's going to be exciting. Um, but first, here's a little bit, uh, a little reel of my work um, as director, animation lead, or animator. <laughs> Animation is probably the slowest, most laborious, expensive, and difficult way to make a film. Um, so why go to all this trouble? Um, why do we do it? Is it just because we don't have animals that are small enough that we can film them that talk? No, of course it isn't. Um, but it's true that animation is often used to make things that don't exist. Uh, but that's not the only reason. Um, so this slide is... There's a book called Understanding Comics by a guy called Scott McCloud, and he, I think he sort of sums it up, because it relates to the first thing that you need to decide when you're figuring out how something should look. So if you look at the face on the left, so the top left, like the photo reel one, um, almost, <laughs> uh, it's definitely somebody specific, right? It's somebody else. It's not you, it's somebody else. And if you look at the image on the right, the smiley, it's so abstract that it's, it's somebody, but it's also anybody. And, it's more abstract and therefore less specific. And that's kind of the key to why animated characters work so well. Um, because you, you, you take something down the abstraction plane and it becomes easier to connect with in a lot of ways, especially for young kids, right? So there's a reason why animation for young kids, it's not all animation isn't for young kids, obviously, but there's a reason why it connects, because it's much easier for kids to see themselves in it. So it's, for example, you know, Totoro here and, um, there's a reason why Japanese 
it's no accident, basically, that Japanese animation, so, many, so much successful Japanese animation, has a lot of detail in the backgrounds. And the characters are very simple, because the background's detailed enough for you to, to really explore it and find new things all over the place. Um, but the characters are simple enough for you to, to let you into the background, basically, let you into the world. And I think this is, um, you know, there are no set rules, of course, but when you're figuring out how your project should look, I think this is incredibly important, where you put your abstraction level. Um, and I think you need to be clear on that um, before you start and, and how that works. <clears throat> so that balance was especially tricky in this next project, which I want to talk about. So in Europe, we're seeing that less and less commercials are made. and more and more brands are kind of uh, doing little stories, little emotional stories that connect you with their brand because people don't really watch commercials anymore. As soon as they see a commercial, they skip or click away, right? Um, so this is all about kind of brand values and emotions. So this next one was a thing that I did uh, recently, just over Christmas, basically, um, for a Swedish brand called Klaas Olsson. And it's a love story between a flower and a butterfly. They wanted live action feel, but uh, you know, obviously, we can't find a fly that talk or the fly that sorry a um, flower that moves and portrays emotion. So we have to make this perfectly CG flower to fit into the and butterfly to fit into this world. Um, and it should be emotional and poetic, not funny. And obviously, when you're thinking ca cartoon flower, you don't necessarily think not funny, right? It's quite easy to make a flower look silly. Um, so this was quite a kind of a quite a challenge actually. So this is from my director's treatment, which is sort of the roadmap for the project, um, and uh, also how you win the job, coincidentally. But um, you can see the bottom panel, you know, the flower has eyes, and it's a much more kind of cartoony thing. But the more that I worked into it, the more I found out that simpler is better, you know? Um, and we just, we basically decided to tell the story in the simplest way possible, um, and just using the petals for emotions and a big challenge, but um, but it ultimately makes it work much better. Uh, and also, I did sort of some very crude CG at this point, but just trying to sort of work out all the angles, work out how it how it works, but just in the in the very simplest forms and trying to make each panel tell a story. So you can see the lower panel on the right. The whole thing is that the flower is imprisoned, you know, can't be can't be out because it's springtime and it wants to it obviously wants to get out. So. It's sort of a sad, melancholy love story than an uh, overflowing romantic love story. Um, and so we're just sort of you know, working into the ideas, very, uh, but, but trying to keep it very, very simple. So um, this was also something we were thinking about in, in the design of the flower. You know, how do you make a flower that is realistic enough to fit into the world, but if it's too realistic and too held back, you can't express those emotions, you know? So it's, it's a really fine balance you have to tread when you're doing this kind of stuff. Um, and with a butterfly, of course, it's easier because a butterfly, oh, sorry, yeah, here's the, <clears throat> here are the different uh, expressions. So the way we thought of it was that the top petal would be able to, it's like a flag for emotion. You know, if it's sad, it, it droops. If it's happy, it's up like that. And the side ones are almost like eyebrows. Um, and, and you know, you look at a still like this and it doesn't work, but as soon as you get that into animation, it will, and that's when you have to kind of really build trust with clients and all sorts of other people that aren't seeing it from this, you know? Um, anyway, so yeah, the, the, with the butterfly, it's, we, we went for a very simple option, but of course it's easier because it can move. But this is a romantic love story, so um, I don't know if you've ever looked at a butterfly up close, but they're pretty terrifying, <laughs> you know? They're not exactly love story material, you know? It's like, oh, I feel so romantic now. Um, so how do you do that? How do you make it, you know, you can't get close, you have to make it romantic, you have to, all these things. Um, so in the end, oh yeah, this is the CG uh, models. We did a simplified take on a real butterfly and made it quite furry and also just didn't go in close, didn't, you know, try to stay wide and, and, and let the animation do its thing, basically, to tell the story. So this was a live action film um, with humans in it, but we weren't really interested in the humans because they weren't the stars. The stars were the animated characters. And so 
in a way, the humans are background, so that's the way we kind of consciously treated them. They have to be background things. So they were either out of focus or cropped or far in the background or in some way obscured um, so that they don't start to become characters and steal the show because they're part of the set, essentially. Um, which is a tricky way to brief an actor, by the way, because you kind of like, so yeah, you're basically just, you know, part of the set, you're kind of a chair, you know? <laughs> so that's kind of tricky sometimes, but they were very cooperative, which was great. Um, so here's a little bit of the animatic. It's just a 2D animatic before any CG or live action was made. That was just a little bit. So we started with that, obviously. We also did a previous so we could help plan everything. Um, but then we had to do the live action shoot while the CG was being established, prepared, whatever you want to call it. Um, so this was in Stockholm. And you'll notice how unglamorous it looks. Um, basically, we wanted to build the whole set because then you're more in control of the lighting. You can get, you know, especially when there's so much post-production, so much blue screen. Um, being on a location, it would be really hard because you'd run and bump into walls and all sorts of stuff. Um, so this was in Stockholm. We had to build, extend the set downwards to the side and upwards, and then also build the whole, the whole world outside. Because this is Stockholm in, in winter, you know, and we had to make a spring movie. Um, and I don't know if any of you have been to Stockholm, but there's about that much snow. Uh, so it was a little bit tricky to find a location that would make us feel all warm and fuzzy. Um, so, yeah, you can see all the objects we filled. It made it look like a real home. Um, and here it's a shot on a Ari Mini, and <clears throat> and you have the uh, the stunt flower basically. So we'd we'd have the real kind of the real pot and the real everything else, but then you'd use those for framing and also just to block out the movement roughly. Even though we had storyboard and previs. But it was kind of a challenge because this camera is massive, even though it's called an Ari Mini, it's absolutely huge. Um, and getting in like that, and this was a very, this is quite a complicated camera move because in CG it's brilliant. You can just put a few keyframes and do whatever with the camera. But here we're orbiting around characters like that and then telling a DOP that, yeah, that we want to do that, that'll be fine, right? <laughs> um, and just watching all the blood drain from his face as you're sort of talking to him. Um, but, but in the end, they kind of came up with some sophisticated gripology, and we got it done. Um, and also, we shot without a window, because the reflections are a total nightmare, so we could just recreate those afterwards. Um, and lots of you know pointing and shouting and stuff. <laughs> um, and complete of It's funny with these guys, because when they're booking uh, gear, you know, you see the list, they always go totally overboard. So we had this massive crane, you know, and we're filming a butterfly that's like this. It was pretty, it's like, do we really need that? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I'm really happy with the final result. Um, so I hope you like it.
Okay, so this next project is a, uh, I'm Danish, um, obviously, so uh, it's a book that I grew up with, which everybody really loves in Denmark, but I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, the way you say that is Ole Frosnaber, <laughs> and um, that's not the easiest thing to pass across your lips, but um, the English title it was given was Freddy Frogface, but I will always think of it in the Danish title, of course. Um, it was a movie from Denmark which I directed and co-wrote. Um, it's about a bully called Orla who, uh, and a boy named Victor who's terrorized by self-same bully, and, but he manages to outsmart him all the time. It's basically a kind of a brains over brawn type story. And um, the book has been on the curriculum since the 70s, so everyone uh, who went to school in Denmark since the 70s was forced to read it, basically. They didn't have a choice, so that's fantastic. Um, and a lot, luckily, a lot of people loved it. Um, even though Europe is really small, of course, there are huge cultural differences from country to country. And this was a very Danish film intended for a Danish audience. So quite small, and the budget had to sort of fit that. You know, you can't. It's in a country of five and a half million people, you can't, you know, spend $30 million on a film, obviously, because there aren't that many dollars. Um, or krona, as the case may be. So this, um, this author is uh, he's called Ole Lund Kierkegaard, and uh, he's as well known in Denmark as Hans Christian Andersen. Um, and most of that appeal, or a lot of that appeal, is due to his sort of quirky, messy, characteristic illustrations. You know, they're very loose and kind of a bit sort of, they have a kind of an ugly charm to them, but they're you know, undeniably ugly. But there's something cool about that as well. So they'd never been animated before in CG movie. Um, so the big challenge for us was to translate that quirky, loose feeling into something as not loose and rigid as CGI. Um, so you know, it was vital to keep the spirit and the charm of the illustrations. So in the design process, um, yeah, that's the blacksmith on the right, or the, sorry, the, the strong man, and there's all sorts of very, kind of just really silly characters, you know, that don't, you don't look at that and think CG, right? So it was a bit of a challenge. Um, so we kind of figured out, we, we, need to, we need to make the rules of this. Um, so there are no straight lines anywhere ever in this world. Um, size relationships are extremely distorted. So, you know, in real world, if, if I'm an adult, then, you know, a kid might, might be like that, you know, because they're all told from the from the child's perspective. Um, <clears throat> and there's lots of asymmetry, like nothing symmetrical whatsoever. And also there's a smallness and humbleness to the whole thing. It's never too big or too grand. Um, also, we had to figure out, you know, how stylized do we want to go, the sort of level of reality that we talked about earlier. Um, is it textured? Is it tactile? You know, would you feel like you could touch it? Um, and also attitude to color, you know cold, dusky versus warm, like which parts of the film do we want to feel, feel uh, warm and which cold, et cetera, et cetera. So due to limitations on budget and time, we had to come up with a lot of processes, um, sort of different type of processes than the normal ones um, to save time. So the first one was to, that we wanted to be able to start on the blocking before the sets were built, which is a horrible thing normally. Um, uh, and Basically, we needed a process to allow us for that. So what could we do you know, that would allow us to start that? We could lock down the sort of rough layout of things and the sizes. So that's what we did. So we did super kind of ugly 1985 gaming style uh, blocking, which is just really, really primitive. But you, know, you can just work out a rough layout without having to sign off on a design that you're not happy with because of time constraints. So, this is fine and this will be good, good for our purposes. This has to stay the same size and more or less the same layout or all your scenes are messed up. Um, but basically we do that, we then design over this uh, in just in lines and sort of messy line drawings. Um, and then paint to get the feel and then this is the final CG render. So we do this for all the sets, this is the circus and one of the very kind of rough stand-in characters. <coughs> um, and it was a quite a good way of getting something decent uh, quickly, but also allowing the other processes to happen. Um, now, with the characters, we also look for rules. So, uh, you know, small eyes close together, far between the legs. Mostly, they don't really have much shoulder. You know, the shoulders are quite narrow. Hair is like kind of straw, or not kind of not wispy at all. Um, giant feet, <laughs> and sort of simple shapes at the base of each of each design, like the sort of triangle um, of the blacksmith there. 
and we kind of felt like if we obeyed those designs, these final designs would would look would sort of give the same feeling. Um, it would be it would be familiar but different, you know, and that's sort of what you want to go for. Um, and hopefully, you know, people would think it was it was faithful to the books that were so well loved. So just about going on previews, not storyboards. So there are advantages and disadvantages to storyboards. So um, we were a small setup, so quite often you need a storyboard to communicate between all the different departments almost as much as the production needs a storyboard. So it's a communication tool in, a, in a many ways. And so the great thing about storyboards are, is you can, uh, storyboards are that you have expressions, so you can tell the story. That helps, of course. Uh, it's a looser process. You can explore more. But the negatives of that are good choreography, you know, moving the characters around, especially in crowd scenes and stuff, can be super difficult with traditional storyboarding because getting the storyboarders getting their head around that, it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, and strictly speaking, none of that art ends up on screen. You know, it's, it's all great as a blueprint, but it is, you know, it goes out the window, which Maya scenes don't. And if you have to cut somewhere, of course, it would, it would be ideal that you had everything and you could do uh, step by step by step. But when you don't, you need to find creative ways around it, right? <clears throat> also, there are lots of cheats when you storyboard. You might, you know, we found out on Despero, you had a storyboard showing uh, the mouse's character in close up on a certain background. And then when you put that into 3D, he's floating 30 meters into the air and it's impossible. So there'd be lots of issues like that. Excuse me. Um, so we decided in this process that I would give briefings to the, to the storyboarders. Um, uh, we do the radio play, you know, record the voices, all that stuff. Um, and but we found storyboard artists who also knew Maya. They were also, you know, sort of proficient with the software, but you know, but not specialists. They just needed to know enough to be able to do this. Um, so for me, it's great as a director because it's a fluid way to shape things, and it's the effect of having more time, but without more money added to the budget. So just to show you the process reel here. Um, so. Yeah, so here you can see it's a stereoscopic film, so that's what they... Sorry, can you put on the mic on? Thank you. Um, so the, the little square is, a, is the, where the 3D focus is. Sorry, we don't need to hear that. Okay. So the red camera is the active camera. It's like a TV shoot, basically. So we just plan it all very, very loosely with these characters. Um, and it pops around like that to the active cameras. And you can, you can build a scene very quickly and, and also revise it very quickly, you know? Um, which is a really great way to work. Let me try and go forward here. Okay. So now this is that same scene from, uh, from the camera's view. So with all the different cameras that are popping around as in which is the active. So you have one big nice tracking move that you can refine lots. Um, and all these assets would just be exchanged later, you know? So it's fairly easy to imagine what the final thing is gonna look like. And you can see how rough it is. Like, you know, you put a pencil drawing on someone's face just to get emotions. Um, so of course it requires a certain amount of imagination, uh, but when you have a smaller group of people, you don't need to communicate quite that clearly. Everybody's more on the same page. So. Sorry. So in a sec, you'll see that, yeah, so this is the final rendered. But yeah, so basically that was a very good process and you can, um, <laughs> um, it's just you need to kind of come up with ways around the constraints because there are always going to be constraints and then, and, you know, in 
the whole, we, you know, we made a stereoscopic feature film for less than $3 million, you know, and that's kind of unheard of. Um, so, you know, is it perfect? No, but it's pretty good for the constraints we had, I think. So, so you kind of need to be creative when you're, when you're working around these things rather than going, okay, we just need more money, basically. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a success, and um, it was released in Denmark, um, and stayed among the top five movies for around three months the year it came out, which was great and sold a load of tickets. Um, so here's just a clip um, from the movie, from the towards the end of the movie where things are going not are not going well for all other bully, and he comes up with a very unwise plan of hiding in a loaded circus cannon. Um, hope you enjoy. <laughs> who wins in the end, obviously. Um, right, so the next project is, this was another CG feature film which had a long history before I got involved. Um, it had been in production a few times and hit various hurdles with financing and so on that sometimes happens. So um, when they came to me with this project, it had been through various writers, producers, and it had lots of potential, but it had become like a big, fat hodgepodge of ideas and needed to be given some clear direction. So, of course, the most important thing was to get the script working first. Um, and lots and lots of rewrites on rewrites on rewrites meant that the story didn't really feel very cohesive and it didn't feel like it was written in one voice. So we hired a writing duo from Canada for a major rewrite, but of course there were lots of voices that needed to be heard and have input as well, because there are on you know any movie. Um, so to kick off this rewrite, we had a two-day session in Montreal in Canada, um, where by the end of it, we wanted to have sort of the basics worked out. Um, so uh, there are risks of working with 10 people in a room, as I'm sure everyone knows. You know, it can get very quickly get super messy. And um, if not managed properly, you could quickly end up discussing some insignificant detail for half the day, and then you've lost all your, you've lost all your time. So, People were flying in from all over the place, so we had to kind of come up with a system to make this work. So discussions were led by two of us, um, but to avoid breaking the flow, if anybody else or when everybody, anybody else had a thought or a comment or an idea, they'd put it on a post-it and they'd put it on the wall. And then after our sessions, we'd build in some time to literally just clear the wall and talk about every single thing. So everybody was heard, um, but we didn't get lost or stuck or start talking about, you know, the attitude to someone's moustache in the third act or whatever silly little thing that you can get stuck on. So um, where we wanted to do, we began the session by nailing down and agreeing the basics, like whose story is it? You know, it, normally it's pretty clear if you've got a hero's journey, which this was. Um, but you know, it's important to think it, it informs all your decisions along the way. You know, who is the main player here? Um, what's their goal? Goals can change along the way as well, but you need to know what they want, of course. And then, in contrast to that, what's their underlying need? So, for example, you know, a need as opposed to want. So, I may be a middle-aged man uh, wanting a big motorbike, um, but what I really need is to feel young again. Do you know, it's that kind of thing, what drives you. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so, turning points also, like, which is the main... The main bits where things change, you know, and you also, you're in, if you look at a scene and you say that, and you see there's no turning points, you're kind of in trouble because nothing really happens, you know. Um, you know, somebody needs to learn something, somebody needs to change their mind, something new needs to come in, there needs to, something has to happen. Um, and then choice, like, then what's the most important choice a character needs to make? What's their moment of truth? You know, there needs to be one, otherwise you're kind of flat. Um, 
and themes. Um, so, for example, themes meaning, you know, for example, living up to your parents' expectations or, you know, uh, unrequited love, whatever it might be. But it's good to be fairly clear on it. Um, um, you have to be careful with themes because they can also become a little bit preachy, you know, um, if you think too much of it. But it's good to be aware of. So from there, we'd begin dis discussing and discussing and discussing. And by the end of day two, we had the film on a board. So act one, what happens? Act two, what happens? Act three, what happens? And that is from a character perspective, you know? So you have what happens, when it happens, and basic intentions, but not exactly how it happens, because um, that's to be worked out. Um, um, so basically, this would allowed us to let our writers go and do a draft, but we still all felt safe um, in that they wouldn't go totally off-piste and go off-track, because it was quite clear, you know? And it was a very good collaborative process because everybody had something to offer, but it didn't derail things, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and then concurrently, we were finding out how it should look. So trolls are traditional Scandinavian folklore characters. They're big, they're nasty, they're monstrous, they have uh, some sort of common traits like large noses, stocky build, the use of natural elements like grass for hair, branches, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but of course, these are way too scary to be main characters, right? I mean, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're not, you know, the guy on the lower left, you're not exactly gonna you know, feel a whole lot of empathy for him, um, unless it's Beauty of the Beast type thing, Beauty and the Beast. But um, yeah, so I wanted to mix it with something more cute and something a bit kind of, you know, chunky and cute and a bit, a little bit more accessible. Um, and also um, getting some nice silhouettes. Like, I think it's super important in character designs, especially if you have a lot of characters, that they have a clear silhouette. So like this guy here, you know, he's a triangle. And, and it's good to sort of just try and think overall. You could even just do simple shapes at the beginning of a project to just go, you know, who's that? He, that's the triangle, that's the circle, that's the square, and, and just work your ideas from there. Um, so that's what we did. Um, but also, what do you not like? What do you want to avoid? So you know, that's also a good thing to brief the artists. You know, what do we not want here? You know, because um, it's as important. Um, so then, there's a, a really great French character artist called um, Jean Baptiste Monk, um, and he started doing pencil sketches, but pretty quickly went into 3D. Um, he works in ZBrush. Um, and I think it's more and more now you're seeing people going into 3D earlier, and I think that can be great sometimes because uh, if they can still be loose enough with it that you can make changes, it's, very, it's a very effective way of working. So this was the final, this is Grimmer, the villain, troll. Uh, so this was the final character. So we also did environments at the same time. Nature, but it needed to, needed to feel inhabited, but also like part of nature. So this is kind of the troll village. Um, bit closer in the troll village, you know, kind of using natural things like holes and roots and stuff for, to try and make it feel as natural as possible and using those interesting shapes that you get from nature. Um, and trolls come in all sizes. So here you have land shifters, which are mountain, mountain trolls, basically, um, that kind of get up every 200 years and walk to the next valley. <clears throat> and this is a druid's, uh, a druid's den. It's all magical and messy. And then, this didn't make it to the movie, but it's, it, we went to the human city, and there in the design, we were trying to contrast everything. You know, it's all straight lines, it's all unnatural colors mostly, you know, like the purples and the reds and stuff. Um, and just trying to contrast things and make it really clear. There was also a museum of oddities with like an, an atomic grandma and the world's biggest walnut and uh, all sorts of silliness, but again, you know, away from nature. Um, so to sell the movie, we made a teaser. And so uh, along with all these designs, the teaser as well, that was how the movie was financed, basically. Um, so it's not a scene from the film. It's just a short episode, a little sketch, basically, um, to give the flavor it. So let's just look at the process. So voice, so voice recording, of course. Um, we always try and record everything in the script, but allow a, a little bit of flexibility for ad-libs and happy accidents. Um, so this was a lot of fun to record. This was them record was us, sorry, <laughs> recording a scene where a character, one character sneezes into another character's mouth and it's pretty disgusting and it was quite funny. Okay, White, whenever you're ready to roll on line four, Slater, up and go. It's perfect. Come on, Captain. We'll be safe here. It's perfect. Now, shut, shut, whisper. Next. 
Stop sneezing! Stop sneezing! Stop sneezing! Great. Right. Got we got one? Love it? <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Keep yeah, do the gags and yeah, keep it separate from the mm, could be worse. You got it. He tastes his own. He tastes the snot. Dribble yeah, one, yeah, line four, yeah. ABC take one. <laughs> could be worse. <laughs> 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 So pretty disgusting, but a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> also now, um, whether it's dialogue or silent or even dancing, I always or nearly always try and record myself acting out the parts for animation and always encourage the animators to do the same um, as much as they possibly can because it's obviously useful as a visual reference, but also it makes you just spot stuff. It makes you come up with things you otherwise wouldn't come up with. Um, and also, you, you have a natural timing when you're acting stuff out, and that doesn't always come across if you're just looking at a timeline. So I think it's crucial, time is crucial. Um, so it's with a lot of hesitation that I show you this, but... Uh, <laughs> you go. We'll be safe here, it's perfect. Perfect. The perfect for plunging to certain death. Actually! Uh, Stop sneezing! Sorry, but I'm allergic to danger! <laughs> I'm gonna hang you up by the tail! Yeah. Where are you? You yeah, sorry excuse for a troll tail! <laughs> Where the troll are you? So... <laughs> Strange we didn't get any Oscars, I don't understand it at all, but, um, okay, and it's, um, so I'll, I'll show you the final teaser. So based on all these materials, the film was greenlit and the rest is history. for some stop motion. Um, Corpse Bride was a stop motion feature film uh, directed by Tim Burton and Mike Johnson and I worked on it as a key animator. <clears throat> I'm aware that most people here are involved with um, thanks. <laughs> are involved with uh, CG production so I won't go too much into the technicalities but I just wanted to show you a little bit about how a stop motion film is produced. So Here's me, a younger me, and, and one of the other animators. And you can see the characters are about so high, and you have the whole set built, so everything 
that ends up in the frame is pretty much real, you know? Um, so you spend months and months and months working on these, these uh, sets. Uh, so it's a kind of an odd but uh, interesting life. Um, and here's the armature, the skeletons that are inside the puppets. Everything's tightened very, very kind of sp um, precisely so you, to be able to give you tiny little movements and make it very uh, precise, basically. So here you have these, um, to make the mouth shapes, you have these paddles here, one, two, three. Um, and with that, you can make any kind of shape, basically, on the mouth to give you your lip sync. And you have them on the top and the bottom of the mouth. And, and there's a lot of very precise engineering that goes into these puppets. This is Victor, the main character's head, uh, an early version. And this is how we open the mouth. You stick an Allen key in the ear, uh, and that's how you open the jaw, like this. And the silicon skin kind of stretches, and it, it all looks very convincing. And, they, and then you use those, you use tools like this, sculpting tools, to kind of sculpt the lips, etc. And here you have, a, this is how they blink. You put lots and lots of replacements. So for each frame, you know, it's, you have a, a shape um, that you put onto the puppet. Cobb's Bride's hair had all sorts of different um, wire in it, according to how we wanted it to move. The heavier bits had thicker wire, of course. Um, but everything has to be poseable and sort of perfect. So same with the veil. The veil had all sorts of uh, wire sewn into it to make it movable. Um, at one point, we were talking about doing this to move the dress. It didn't work, but it's just one of the experiments we had to do to try and make it work, like suspending it with fishing wire from above. So everything's physical and everything has to hold its shape, and that's, uh, it's kind of crazy, but fun. <laughs> and of course, um, so the animators will have seen these, but not many people use them anymore. But this is a, a dope sheet, obviously, so you have all the little intonations, and you plan your shot, and you go through um, you can see here, you should have seen him with fur, um, is the line, but you've got it all broken down into phonetics here for the mouth shapes. And then that's how you plan your shot. And then you plan it once, and that's, that has to work, because um, you get one shot, basically. This is uh, one of my sequences, Moonlight Sequence, when uh, Victor has tricked uh, Corpse Bride, Emily, to come to the real world, um, the human world. And he's sort of having, he's a bit very conflicted about it. So I'll just take you through the stages. Here's the animatic. Oh. I'd forgotten how beautiful the moonlight is. Obviously, without music, she sounds kind of crazy in that scene. So the things are, <laughs> things are kind of being built. Um, and this next one is basically an in-progress version. So you'll see a kind of a block following her around as she moves. And that's how we hold the character up sometimes, because they're quite tall and heavy, so they fall over easily. And there's a ton of stuff that obviously gets um, painted out. You'll also, if you notice, when she's turning, she's got a CG veil, which was added in some shots. <laughs> And then, here's the final scene. I spent so long in the darkness, I'd almost forgotten how beautiful the moonlight is. <laughs>
I should prepare mother and father for the big news. I'll go ahead and you wait here. Perfect. I won't be long. Stay right here. I'll be right back. Okay. No peeking. <laughs> So we don't have a lot of time, but I'll um, try and get through here. Um, fantastic Mr. Fox, uh, there's not a lot to say about it. It's very much the same as Corpse Bride, except the style is very different. And the style is sort of also incredibly important because the color palette, for example, there's nothing uh, blue in the whole movie except the character's eyes. And it's very, uh, they use stop motion very well. You know, they kind of showed, showed the limitations or made a, made a feature out of the limitations of stop motion, you know? Um, but here are some shots that, from my scenes. Dodge the grabbers, duck the taggers, jump the twig basket, and knock the cedar stick off the cross rock! Ash, that was pure wild animal craziness. You're an athlete. Mm-hmm. Here, put this bandit hat on. So you'll notice that all the, all the characters are either straight on or profile, and that's a very kind of specific thing that Wes Anderson wants, basically. We even had like a Wesometer, which was like a lay overlay on the screen, where things have to be in the middle or on the thirds, and the same, like everything's kind of incredibly sort of very tight. Um, and just about the, the, the palette, you know, you can see everything, even the skies, there's no blue anywhere. It's all very much kind of in monochrome, um, or just very, very carefully picked colors. And that's a good thing in whatever you're developing and whatever the attitude to color is, you have to be aware of it because um, it just gives it like a visual identity, you know? <clears throat> so I was going to talk a little bit about planning for long form. Watership Down was a four hour story, um, a new adaptation of the classic book as opposed to the movie. It, um, but on such a big proje project with so many story strands and B stories and everything, you need tools to figure out to keep you from getting lost. And because you might make a change in part one that's going to ruin something in part four, etc. cetera. Um, so I do a brief for every single scene, which is like a central place for everyone, also the artist, to go. So for example, <coughs> excuse me, camera ideas, but also the most important thing is the general idea. You know, um, here the general idea in this scene is now they have a home at last. So let's try and, you know, that informs a lot of things, like the way you shoot it, you don't want to be super dramatic because it's a happy scene, all these things. Um, when you're staging action, we were making SketchUp models to figure out where everything happens. And also the farmer's wife, how the kind of vibe of how she should be, you know, looking for references. But this is all just like a centralized bit of the main intention. Um, all right, time's up, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'd like to just show you one, one thing. Um, well, I've actually got two things left to show you. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll show you some um, herd. Um, yeah, this is just, just very quickly, this is some early development art from Watership Down. There's uh, quite often, you know, you want to sh play, the, play the fear and the danger, and quite often it's all about what you don't see rather than what you do see. So hiding the danger is often much more effective. Um, so we kind of looked at that in many ways. Now, this is my own uh, project called King of the Swamp. Um, it's a feature idea which I've written um, and I'm currently developing. Uh, it's about a grumpy swamp monster who lives in a kind of a world where uh, supernatural creatures live alongside, uh, live alongside um, humans. So uh, basically he, he, you know, he, he used to be a romantic idealist at heart, a fun-loving free spirit, but um, these days he doesn't like anybody or anything and it takes some kids to kind of bring that out of him. And he gets sort of reluctantly dragged into a kind of a, uh, an adventure role, you know, and it becomes a, he's like a reluctant hero sort of thing. Um, and then these are the kids that he sort of teams up with, the main characters, Sam, a fairy boy who kind of has a real um, chip on his shoulder because he never gets taken seriously because he's a fairy. Um, and, you know, he isn't allowed to fly in school because the other kids aren't. Um, and Daisy, the human girl who's like his friend, but she's kind of keeps him out of trouble a lot and sort of feels... She's like an older sister almost. Uh, and then Hemlock, the kind of villain fairy. Um, and this idea was inspired by looking at the way kids play. Uh, 
they have no, uh, they don't have any problem with putting, you know, there's no prejudice. They'll happily put a robot having, you know, with a sheep having a tea party with a vampire. They don't care, which I think is really, really inspiring, but it has to make sense. So that's what this idea um, kind of does. And now for something totally different. Um, this is a preschool project, which is also my own creation. Uh, it's a silly orange elephant boy called Belly, who plays music on his trunk, and uh, uh, his friend Toaster, who's a blue hippo. Um, this is the first video on the project. It was produced um, in cooperation with these guys, Gummy Bear International, um, through their studio in Hungary. Um, and you're the first in the world to see it. It will probably be out on YouTube and elsewhere online from next week. Hope you like it. We're going to now move on to taking some questions from the audience. Yes, Varmasa. Ah, okay. Uh, I just the 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 uh, CD feature book, which you have shown. CD feature. Yes. Uh, what yeah. is the duration of that? Wait, which one? The earlier one. Not the, the Danish one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was eighty minutes. Eight zero. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you are even the development, design development, uh, starting from there, so from script to design development and the uh, starting of the production. How, what is the kind of time you took? 18. Design, design development? It was about 18 months. It was crazy months, quick. <laughs> yeah, it was really fast. I think we had a few months to develop stuff before once, uh, because it happened in stages. It wasn't just just green lit like that. It was we got some development money from the film institute in Denmark, and then you know step by step. But yeah, the main production was 18 months, um, which is below average by far. You know, which is why we had to think of stuff. <laughs> you know, to come up. It was a huge challenge from the illustration to the creating. Yeah, exactly. Great work. And there were then three movies made so based on his other books. Um, so they reused all the assets from our movie um, to then do others which so they started the next movie started halfway through okay. our production so it's all it was all like a part of a plan basically thanks, thanks. <coughs> yes Shrira. Hey, here. hey uh, very thank amazing stuff I thank you <laughs> let's hope so <laughs> it's quite different to all the rest yeah and christian wrote the melody I could see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I felt it, I felt it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pete, um, since you mentioned that you have worked with uh, Wes Anderson and 
temporary, you know, the characters who have a vision, a very strong vision, specifics for the scenes. Uh, how much of a freedom did they let you have when, you know, you were working on these particular shots, or sequences? Um, in terms of performance? Yeah. Quite a lot, actually. Was, was, was Anderson less so? Like, um, he was in Paris uh, for the whole production. We were in London. And then there was an animation director who was the one we interacted with, Mark Gustafson. Um, and then, but then we'd be, e which was kind of a weird setup, because we'd be emailing Wes, and he'd always reply very quickly, but he'd be sitting in a hotel in Paris on the email all the time. Um, and he always wrote in capitals. And politely, it wasn't a shouting, but it was just kind of odd. Um, uh, so we'd send stuff back and forth loads of times, um, and and he'd be very specific. But he is very, I mean, that's why he, his stuff is amazing. He has a, such a vision, you know, of everything. Um, like right down to, you know, like the placement of a teaspoon in a shot, you know. It'll be like kind of, no, let's not, let's not shoot it because we have to do this and this and this. So that was much more specific. With On Corpse Bride and Frankowini, it was... Uh, it was more loose, I think, but loose isn't the right word because you're, there's so much stuff that's already set up and like the world is already established and everything. So we just give our take on stuff, and then you talk about it, you know. And that's why animators are. Mu it's it's um, the role on a stop motion film for an animator is different to the role on a CG film because there's fewer of us, you know. There's only like 14 to begin with on Corpse, or six to we started as six, right? Because a puppet like that, like a Victor puppet, costs about fifty thousand pounds to make. So you don't do too many duplicates. I think we had maybe four or five. And they're all handmade, and it's such a, it's such a craft to make these things that animators have to sort of be let run with it. It's not, you can't get you know, 20 people on the same character because there aren't that many puppets. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. Any further questions? Yes, gentleman at the back. Uh, hi. Um, Hello. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like, I have a tattoo of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just want to ask if, um, like, working with these directors, right? So, like, was it hard to implement your own, like, did you have a specific style of animating in uh, stop motion, or, uh, like, is it just, like, is it more towards the Tim Burton style of animation, or is it towards the uh, it, it totally depends on the project, because, on, on uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, it's, it was much more about bring, making it look stop motion y, as in what people connect with stop motion y, sort of jittery, and the fur is hopping around. So we'd do stuff like, you know, the can air that you use to clean cameras with? You'd just psh, do one of those before you take the frame, which means the fur kind of goes like that, and which gives it all a bit of life. Um, and you'd never do that on a film like Corpse Bride, because it all has to be incredibly sort of smooth and perfect. A lot of people thought Corpse Bride was CG. Um, so I went to Comic Con with it after after we shot, and uh, a lot of people came up and asked, "So you know, it's CG animation, right?" And it's like, "Excuse me, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing, right?" So in, you know, Fantastic Mr. Fox wasn't like that. It was very, you know, it sort of celebrated the, the fact that it was stop motion. So you adapt to pro each project. Uh, I also wonder the last scene in uh, Fox, right, where the like the lady she turns into butterfly, right? Did you, was that CG or was that uh, stop motion? A bit of both. Uh, yeah, so it's basically you have her moving, and then at some point you take her out, and then she becomes butterflies, and it's all the, all the butterflies are CG. Yes. Thank you so much for that Thank great you. session. I'm going to request you to sign our poster over there. All right. and Thanks. <laughs>